thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I went through the emails that of people that have sent stuff in um, to, to join today. And it's, uh, again, very, very humbling. There were 37 different countries which uh, for, where people are, are tuning in from or recording from or or whatever. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, for just sharing some time with us as we, we're going to talk about uh, the core elements of goalkeeping. Uh, as you as as you're aware, the special special guest is Jason Grubb. Um, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be how functional I was going to be. I had actually had surgery on Friday, so uh, uh, I'm for, fortunately uh, the drugs and everything worked well, so that's good. And I, I'm I'm semi-functional. It do, doesn't mean that I'm ever going to catch a ball. Not that I ever could, but. Um, you know, at least I'll be able to point in the right direction. And again, as always, if you have uh, any questions as we go through, please feel free to drop it in the chat room. And uh, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can as we go through the presentation. I see again some, some familiar faces. So hello to all those that have joined us in the past. Again, there were, um, as I was saying before, uh, 37 different countries uh, where, where we've had interest from for tonight, um, and roughly 300, yeah, man, if I just 300 this people. So, uh, again, thank you for that. Um, if, if you could, when you come in, if you could mute your, uh, mute your screens or <laughs> mute your microphone, not your screen. Only I should mute my screen, I guess. I, I looked at myself in the mirror this morning. That was enough to scare anyone. So again, uh, we'll start at about 8.05. Um, so we'll give people time to, to log in. Um, I see people already from different parts of the world and different time zones. So uh, thank you for being here. If it's early in the morning, thank you so much. If it's late at night, uh, Hopefully we don't put you to sleep. So uh, again, I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, going to be very, very, very fortunate to have Jason Grubb with us tonight. Jason is a is the director of goalkeeping um, for the Houston Dynamo in the MLS, and in, in my opinion, uh, one of the best youth and grassroots goalkeeper coaches there is. Uh, he's presented at the IGCC um, and was uh, was a participant's favorite. Um, a lot of the participants learned a lot from Jason. So in the presentation tonight, we're going to talk about the core elements of goalkeeping and how it applies to different levels. Um, my thought was, since uh, I'm not working with the grassroots level all the time, Let's bring in someone that is, and that's Jason Grubb. So uh, again, he's, in my opinion, one of the best uh, and most thoughtful goalkeeper coaches there is at working with younger goalkeepers. So both both male and female. So um, again, we'll start up in uh, at eight oh five with a presentation. So just four or five minutes from now. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. So, some great, uh, Sergio Gonzalez is here, Lisa's here, Clint, how are you, sir? I hope you're doing well. So many people that uh, are so passionate about goalkeeping, so th this is fantastic. And again, I just want to stress to those people that are tuning in and that, ha that have tuned in in the past, um, the purpose of these sessions is just to share information. The purpose of the sessions is not to uh, give ideas on what to say, it's more about how. It's not about the what. We all have our own philosophies and our own ways of doing things and teaching. It's the how, how to make people think, how, to, how can we impact people in a different way. So our goal as coaches on this call is to try and impact your thinking um, to, to provoke thought and question. 
uh, and then in turn have you do the same thing in your sessions and with the coaches that you interact with on a daily basis. So, so again, we'll start in uh, a few minutes here. Jason, you, am, I, am I still able to hear you? I believe so. Oh, that's that unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> And again, through, throughout the presentation, um, the, the chat room is available. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to put something in there. We'll try and address as many questions as we can. Uh, you, you'll see at the end of the presentation, uh, my email address is there. I do my best to get back to everyone. Um, Jason's email address will also be there. So if you have questions on some of his uh, parts of the presentation, please feel free to email him directly. Jason, you better be good tonight because Brenton's on. So you've got to watch out for that. Oh, happy days. Yeah, so people checking up on Jason, which is good. He needs that. And like I said, we'll start, we'll start at 8.05. Um, and just so you're prepared, you'll see... Um, uh, a mixed presentation between myself and Jason. Um, instead of having one, you know, the usual usual stuff where one person talks and another person talks, we'll go backwards and forwards, bounce off each other, uh, discuss some ideas, share some things, some video, uh, and also some thoughts on the, the core elements of goalkeeping. Which obviously, when we talk about the core elements of goalkeeping, that applies to every level of the game. And I know personally that oftentimes we actually get away from the core elements of goalkeeping um, because we see something that we want to try without really knowing the reason why or how to add the key elements of goalkeeping into it. And I apologize. Uh, all of a sudden, over the last, uh, I was going to say, you know, now that I've turned 26, uh, my eyesight seems to be going a little bit. Um, so I'll pop these these things on and off. I can't imagine what happens when you hit 27, Jason. I mean, that's... I, my hair's falling out. I'm in all sorts. Yeah. Going grey. <laughs> was, that, was that a 27? That was, yeah, no, actually that was post working with Rogers. Okay, hi. Right. Yeah. So, so coaches, um, uh, again, I uh, just want to express uh, immense gratitude to you for signing on. Um, as I said to the, the group right at the start, there are 37 countries that expressed interest in coming on tonight. People from 37 countries, all levels of the game from uh, you, the, the, the really young goalkeepers through to professional goalkeepers. Um, and, and it's humbling and flattering that you share your time with us. So uh, I greatly appreciate it. Again, the, the purpose of tonight is not to say um, this is the way we should do things. The idea is just to provoke thought, to provoke a discussion um, and potentially impact the way that we look at the game, or at least, at least push us to question how we look at the game. Um, if you look at even the, some of the Premier League games that occurred today, there are some other factors in there that you look at and you say, well, that's, that's a great save or, or he should have saved that because of this, this and this based on your, your philosophy. So tonight, as we go through this, uh, I challenge you, I challenge you to put in, look at things through your philosophy. Um, it's now 8.05, so, so we'll get started. I'm going to share my screen, and as I said, um, Jason and I will go backwards and forwards on different aspects as we go through the presentation. So here goes. Okay, and I'm just going to move this across so I can see. Perfect. So uh, again, w welcome uh, to people from, from all around the world. Uh, again, this is... Uh, a great opportunity for us just to look at goalkeeping in different ways, look at different philosophies um, and share some ideas. It's not what's right and wrong, it's just to provoke thoughts. Uh, and I hope at the end of this session, um, 
that you, that you may have picked up one or two things. Any time in coaching education, any time that you pick up one or two things, or even if it sparks a different way of thinking or a different thought, the opportunity has been worthwhile. Uh, and I certainly hope that this has been worth what this will be worthwhile for you. Um, the, the session tonight, the, the topic tonight is, is going to be about my computer freezing, apparently. I'm just going to stop the share. Let's start that up again. The topic tonight will be, there we go, the, gu the guiding principles, guiding principles and goalkeeping. So I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully this works. Perfect. Okay, so the core elements of goalkeeping. Um, before we get started, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jason Grubb on with us. Jason is the director of goalkeeping for the Houston Dynamo in the MLS. Um, Jason was a presenter at the IGCC in 2019. Um, his methods are very, very uh, progressive. He sees the game in a very insightful way and everything he does, he does with a purpose and with an outcome in mind. Um, and as I said before, when we were talking about uh, core elements of goalkeeping, I wanted to have someone on with me uh, to discuss it through the age ranges. I currently work at the professional level and I also work in the academy and I do some youth work as well. But Jason is in with the youth club all the time, working with young players, watching them grow and watching their different ways of learning. He also does a, uh, a tremendous amount of work in the community outreach in the Houston area. Um, so in my mind, having someone on who's probably more qualified to talk about the, the youth development is important. So Jason, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I know you just got off the pitch as well. I must say that your hair looks good for someone who just got off the pitch. Yeah, not, not too bad. Uh, first and foremost, Phil, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to, uh, to speak this evening. Uh, great to see so many familiar faces on the call. Um, it, it should be a really good opportunity to collaborate here. This has been obviously a lot of fun putting together over the last few days, Phil, going back and forth and, and brainstorming, storming, sharing some ideas. And, and hopefully, as you've mentioned, this is a provoking conversation when it comes to, comes to our thought. And so you, you, your coaches are working in your environment. So really looking forward to this evening. OK, so let, let's kick it off. Um, again, thank you to the, to the partners of the IGCC and the people that work with me. Uh, quick Goal, Quick Tactics, GK Nexus, Goalkeeping Development, Keeper Stop, Catapult, Your Sport, uh, and IMG. So thank you for their support. Um, hopefully the IGCC will be in person this coming June. Um, that is underway and hopefully there'll be some more information coming out in uh, the next couple of weeks. So uh, goalkeeping, uh, when we look at goalkeeping and we look at goalkeeping at its core, there are certain values and certain things that, that we have to take into account. One of the easiest ways uh, to do this is to look at the way that goalkeeping has been taught over the past 20 years. So when you look at goalkeeping at its core, the core elements, what are essential factors in developing goalkeepers? What are things that every goalkeeper must have? And Again, when we look at this, it really depends, a lot of this depends on your philosophy and what you believe in, what you, what you want your goalkeeper to look like. So we, we all have our own personal uh, view of this. I'm going to share some thoughts with you and Jason is going to share some thoughts with you, not only on what are some of these values uh, and core elements, but perhaps ways to work around and implement them into the training and the way things that we do actually on the pitch. So for many years, um, there have been some principles of goalkeeping. And um, so someone brought this up to me, actually, uh, my, my mentor, the person that I would turn to uh, with a question is Peter Meller. Uh, I don't know if Peter is on the call tonight or not. Um, but Peter, uh, founded really goalkeeping education in, in the US. There was no real formal 
goalkeeping education, education in America before Peter Mellor really took hold of it. Um, back in those days, and yeah, that's a long time ago, and even coming out of England and, and parts of Europe, um, there were some principles of goalkeeping, and people said that there were 10 principles, and it was, it was based on very, you know, and, and now I can say this, it was based on old school methodology. So for example, and, I, and forgive me, like I said, I just had hand surgery, so the W, W when you're making a, you know, when you're making a catch. So nowadays, very, very few people talk about the W, all right? So, and they called, and that was called, I think, the, the king consideration because your hands pointed like a crown, I guess. Uh, so here are some of the principles that there were um, that, that still really apply for us and we often overlook. So again, your hand shape. What is that hand shape? Only you can decide what works for, for your goalkeepers um, and they can decide based upon their size, age, experience, and so on. Um, staying on your feet as long as possible still applies. Uh, the set position, uh, can you get set or set consideration? Can you get set um, and activate the body prior to receiving a shot? Uh, the recovery from the ground back to your feet. So quickness in recovery. Getting your body behind the ball as much as possible. So a secondary barrier. Um, the goalkeeper is the first attacker. That is even more prevalent now than it was back in, uh, I would say, 20 years ago. Uh, body shape, how you stand, how you move. Um, the, the awareness of your body. These are just... Uh, seven of the 10 or 11 that people added an 11th and I'm sure now as coaches if we if we wrote down what are the principles of goalkeeping we'd probably come up, come up with 20 or more so these are just some of the principles that were around for many years um, and again I, these definitely still apply and and they're essential to all of our goalkeepers I don't think that there's one of them on here out of these seven. I don't think there's one that we would argue is important as a principle or an element of goalkeeping that's essential. Um, so, so moving ahead, the layers and understanding the building process of the goalkeeper. And again, it is so, it's so important that we understand the athletes that we're working with, the goalkeepers that we're working with, what are the tasks that are being asked of them in the game? And in our previous conversations, um, we've talked about training sessions. We've talked about uh, the, the impact of the game itself on the goalkeeper and also the goalkeeper coach. So understanding the layers which we need to put in place to develop the goalkeepers and, and the core elements of goalkeeping. In order to look at the layers, um, what I've done is I've looked at, and, and, and please don't switch off immediately when I say this, I've looked at the components of the game and how that relates to, how it relates to the core elements of goalkeeping. Um, and each one uh, will have a video and we'll, we'll look at different movement patterns and so on for different age ranges. So um, first and foremost, we have the, the, the physical, uh, preparation and a physical action and then we've got the psychological this uh, and and these are in the order that I I feel I feel of importance so the, the core element for me is the most important one so you've got the tactical decision making and execution in possession and out of possession we have the leadership and social on the field and off the field. And again, as I explained in the last presentation, I feel these, this is very different than the psychological aspect. And we'll talk about this uh, and how it relates in a minute. And then for me, the core, the core element is technical decision-making and execution. Um, and again, the, the, the thing that I feel very strongly about when we're talking about core elements of goalkeeping is I don't know that you can actually uh, separate them all together. So you can't say, well, that's a technical action um, because you don't know what the tactical implication of it was. What was the tactical uh, decision? And then what was the technical action? And did they couple together well? Did they marry together? Those are things that we, that we will have to look at. So as we go through this, 
Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Jason uh, to talk about managing the environment. Yeah, thank you, Phil. So firstly, as we look at this, when we were talking about obviously the five different areas of consideration, I started to think about, right, how would they then break down per the different phases of development that we might have? So then we start to place different types of focus on different phases of our, of our development. So when we look at this, this wouldn't be something that I, I'm saying is set in stone and it's, and it's concrete. But what it does is it gives you a bit of an idea of how we've looked at things here at the Academy, at the Houston Dynamo, how we've looked at things when it comes to developing keepers throughout, throughout these phases. So we'll take the foundation phase, for example. Uh, when we talk about the foundation phase, we talk about goalkeepers age nine through 12. Um, I constantly refer to this stage of, of development as training to learn. Um, so when we talk about training to learn, we talk about, well, what do we need to learn? What does a player need to learn? They need to learn to love the game. So the coach's role and responsibility in instilling that love and that passion for the game from such a young age is, is key. What else, do the, what else do we need to continue to learn? Obviously, the technical side of the game is, is huge. Uh, and the technical and the skill development is, is massive uh, within, within this. So you can see we place a lot of focus on the technical development um, with small uh, problem-solving tactical situations. It's not super complex. However, there is an overlap of the technical and tactical. There has to still be uh, visual cues that the goalkeeper has to pick up on. Um, so that when we, again, we're teaching the, the game as we go through, certainly from this age, and, and, it's, and it's, it's key. The other part that's, that's a huge focus here is the, the social side. Um, we have to understand that players and, and goalkeepers specifically at this age often are more extrinsically motivated. Um, so players are geared towards um, earning a prize. And often the prize is social acceptance at this age. So we have to have that understanding and we have to be mindful of that when we're working with, with young players at this age. Um, Phil, if you want to just click into the next one. And as you progress into that, we talk about the formation phase. So that's uh, players and goalkeepers age 13 through 15. Um, I constantly refer to this age uh, and this phase as training to redevelop. Um, and redevelop um, because there's constant changes physically, and socially within, within the, this, uh, this stage of development. One thing I'd, I'd like to just try and touch upon while, while we're here is that for me, the social side of the game and the psychological side of the game for a 13-year-old goalkeeper is absolutely massive. And as a coach, we have to also become a manager here. Um, and an example being is that we have to manage expectation. When you go from small-sided soccer to full-sided soccer, as a 12 stroke 13 year old, it becomes a very, very difficult environment to be successful in. Size of field, size of area to cover, and obviously size of goal. So we have to constantly manage not only expectation of the goalkeeper, the, their teammates, the head coaches, and obviously the, the directors, so that we don't, we don't uh, discard players who may struggle during this age. And we have to, as coaches, we have to be extremely mindful of this. As you can see, technically, we're caught, it's still a big focus, uh, but there's a lot of redeveloping. Uh, certainly around that 14, 15, where, their bo where bodies are starting to change, we might have to start to redevelop some of the fundamental techniques because the coordination isn't quite the same. And as you see, a little bit of a difference from the tactical side, obviously, tactically, they should be coming more and more in tune with understanding the game demands of, of what our club is, to, is, is telling the goalkeepers. And then into the next one, Phil, and then we progress there into the pre-professional phase. And that, this pre-professional phase can really happen at any age. Uh, for us, typically, it's around the 15 and 16 age. Um, as you can see, there's a smaller focus on the technical development, but there's more focus on the tactical situation, so a lot more decision-making. Um, but the, we have to understand that there's a marry between the two. Um, obviously, the physical side of the game, we need our goalkeepers to be able to adhere to the club's programme. Um, we need them to obviously redevelop the strength, the coordination, the power, so that they are, they're robust when they do step into um, senior soccer, whether that be going into, into college or whether it's going into the professional game. The psychological game at this stage is also massive. And again, it comes back down to managing expectations. Um, one, of the, one of the areas that I've been um, 
I've been guided to think a lot more about recently is that the psychological impacts of the number two and the number three um, on game day. So an example being um, after the game, obviously the number one has played. How then are we turning the attention quickly to the two and the three um, to affect them psychologically to then make them feel just as, just as valued? So a, a good example there would be something that we've instilled recently is um, after the game, actually coming away from the number one and approaching the number two and asking them, what do you want to see in tomorrow's session? Give me just one or two little pieces that you want thrown into tomorrow's session so that we can work. So then, obviously, then they start to get into the driving seat for their, for their own development. Um, so that's really the, 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 four, the three phases that we have. And then, obviously, the fourth phase being the professional phase. But what I'd like to also get you guys to consider is then how might this look within your environment? Now, this, for me, would, would vary from goalkeeper to goalkeeper, environment to environment. But this is just a, a, really a snapshot of how we've sort of approached working with the three stroke four different phases of development throughout the club. So the, the interesting thing is when we talk about this and we talk about um, young goalkeepers and the principles of goalkeeping, uh, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting that a 12-year-old field player can, can miss the goal, uh, take a shot, miss the goal, and, and he or she is said to be developing. We're developing this player. Um, the 12-year-old goalkeeper lets the ball in the back of the net and it becomes a goalkeeping mistake. So somehow we have to try and work with this in our environment to, to allow mistakes to happen. And within your environment, how do, how do you massage these different elements to, to help you uh, or help your goalkeepers progress? So as we look, as we look forward at the physical uh, component of this, uh, and again, there's a lot of questions in the presentation tonight just to try and provoke thought. So are, are we age appropriate in our expectations and training methods? And that means your fundamental movements or your kinesthetic awareness, knowing where your body parts are and how they work together. Um, as, as Jason alluded to, you know, uh, when, when a male or female athlete uh, hits a growth spurt, um, all of a sudden their movement patterns change. And you know, how do we manage that? What's our expectations? Well, you know, he or she is now five foot 11. And of, surely they should be able to make that save because of their physical attributes. But we haven't retrained them. They're like a, a, a Bambi on ice. They can't get their feet to work properly and so on. And they're, all of a sudden, their fingertips are so far away from their eyes that, you know, the, the message seems to take a long time to get there. So are we, as coaches, preparing them with uh, the correct training methods, with the fundamental movements? So again, we go back to getting the body behind the ball and things like that. And are we managing our expectations and giving them realistic expectations? The balance and coordination is a, is a massive part of the physical development. Um, and when we talk about uh, physical preparation and physical action, um, so many goalkeeper coaches work on two-footed activities. So the, the thing about goalkeeping and the thing about football or soccer in general is it's a one-footed activity. You're, you're always loading one leg. Unless you're taking off a of two feet, um, you're always loading one leg. The balance is always support. Your body's always supported primarily when your weight shifts onto one leg. There's a lot of one-legged movements. So are we developing single arm, single leg coordination? Are we working on that balance and coordination aspect? Um, and then do we, do we progress in the complexity uh, um, of goalkeeping specific actions or movements that a goalkeeper may have to do and appropriate distances. So over appropriate distances. And we still have it. I mean, I, like most of you, um, we're, we're connected to social media. I'm, I'm looking at different things to see what people are doing to see if it sparks some, some thoughts. Maybe I can steal some ideas on exercises and so on. And we still see, we still see uh, going over 10 rungs in a ladder. Um, and then sprinting back and doing something else and then doing a forward roll and, or a somersault and then doing something else. And it's still prevalent in the way that people train goalkeepers. And again, as, as I've said before, uh, I'm, very, I'm not criticizing that. It's just not my preferred method. Um, 
I prefer to do things over a, a, a specific distance that relates to the goalkeeper's actual actions in a game. Um, but I also don't know the why for why people do some of the things that they do. So until I do, I can't make a judgment on it. I'm just going to say that those things aren't necessarily uh, my cup of tea. Um, the physical side, are we also incorporating the right nutrition at the right ages? Are we impacting their, their choices at the right ages? That doesn't mean that a 10 year old should be on a diet. Please don't get me wrong. The 10 year old should be eating whatever he or she chooses to eat. Um, you know, can, can we guide them in a certain way as they get older, especially in a professional environment? Yes, we can. Um, but uh, with social pressure and everything else, we don't want to draw attention to that at a young age. Um, activation, uh, and we've talked about this before, and I, I think Jason does an absolutely fantastic job with this in activating goalkeepers once they, they show up at a session. It might be five o'clock at night. And we talked about this a little bit in our, last, in our last meeting, what happens when they get out of the car? What's the activation? Um, is there a pre-training? Do they have a pre-training or a post-training routine? Do you have that for them? Is that something that you can impact? And that may be, uh, and we've talked about this uh, a little bit before, that may be some sort of visual stimulation before they train whether it's uh, one of those light flashing apps like a switched on or whether it's lights or something that engages their mind, their hands and their eyes prior to stepping on the field. Do you use the strobe glasses? Are there things that you can do to trigger the, trigger the uh, nervous system prior to stepping on the field? And then post-training, what are they doing post-training to really take care of their bodies? And even at a young age, that stretching could be um, could be a, a valuable tool and a good habit to get into. Overall, though, we have to manage the expectations. Uh, and again, to, to draw a parallel to something that Jason touched on before, um, you, are, you go from 9v9 to 11v11, you go from a smaller goal into a bigger goal, where all of a sudden the goalkeeper can't even touch the crossbar. Um, I've had this recently, actually, where, where a coach has come to me and said, this goalkeeper has, has let a ball over his head every time we've played a game. Every time. The goalkeeper is five foot three, and there's no chance that he's ever going to touch the crossbar unless he hits a growth spur in the next few years. And, and yet the coach is irate because he can't touch the crossbar. So managing our expectations and giving the goalkeepers permission to accept their limitations at their ages or giving them permission to excel in their, in their physical expectations. Those things become, become very, very important. So Jason, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, just before you push play to the video here, Phil, what I'd like to try and do is just give everyone a little bit of context just behind the video. I think when you, whenever you look at something, especially the video, it's, it's always important to look at it with, with an element of context behind what you're seeing as well. So as Phil was touching upon, everything here is actually pre-training. So I have two different environments or I'm dealing with two different environments in a minute and I'm sure everyone on the call can, can relate to this. Um, I have one group um, that are coming in at 7.45 in the morning and these are teenagers. So it's hard to get these guys up, moving um, and get them active and get them switched on. So I have to be really creative with how I'm working with teenagers at that time in the morning, especially if they've been in the car for up to an hour as well. On the other hand, we have our youngest goalkeepers that we will see first here. Again, they could be driving up to an hour to training after school. I have to make this part of the session fun, engaging, um, and almost and very realistic, and, it's, and especially towards the physical development. So as you push, uh, if you want to push play here, Phil, we can, uh, I'll, I'll talk through as we go. So the first one is just a simple three versus one uh, tag. No different than what, what uh, kids would play at school. So a simple game of tag, lots of movement, lots of fun, lots of coordination. The next look here is just a simple three versus three handball game. Again, and we're talking playing for two, three minutes. Very, very simple, but they're trying to score on each other. This next one here is an interesting one. Again, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, and I'll go into a little bit more 
depth here just after the video, but that's a shuttlecock that they're playing back and forth at one touch. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the video. Simple two versus two, soccer tennis, we've all played it. One touch, a lot of fun, quick reactions, a lot of specific movement. And here, where we talk about the stability and balance, simple cone, all the player has to do is be on one foot, reach down slowly, pick the cone up and reach as high as they can and just hold the cone as high as they can. Opposite foot, opposite hand. Then the last one is again, you, I'm sure everyone on the call has done different type of band activation. So activating the core, activating the glutes, hamstrings. One thing we've tried to do recently is, is include the ball into all types of activation. Ties in nicely as well with what we're, we're talking about tonight, Phil, with the technical side of the game being extremely important or just another opportunity to gain technical repetition. Let me just jump back to just to talk briefly about the, uh, the shuttlecock. Um, not realistic to the game at all, uh, but it's a way for me, because again, again, I'm sure play, uh, coaches here on the call see players every day. We have to keep it really engaging, and sometimes we have to think a little bit different outside the box. Why do I use the shuttlecock? Simple, great for hand-eye coordination, great for reactions, and fantastic for competition. The lads, again, we only play for 90 seconds, two minutes, little competitions, but the lads constantly wanting more. And it's always a fun way. I try and bring it out once every two weeks. It's been, it's been, a, it's been, a, really, uh, it's been a really engaging way to start the session. So, Jason, when you, um, and you use the, the, the 2v2 um, soccer tennis as well, and many, many coaches that are, that are on the, in our meeting right now, they've also used that. I would challenge you coaches to, to also use different size balls. So um, if you've ever tried doing that with uh, one of the kids, uh, kids' balls that is very, very light, that travels differently, Try it with one of those. Try, those, try activities with hand-eye coordination, maybe even with one of those big Swiss balls. And how do you manage that? Um, again, think about the impact that that has physically on the goalkeeper as far as uh, keeping the shoulders square to the ball and keeping things moving towards the ball. Uh, so using different size uh, balls and different types of balls can often impact the goalkeepers in, in a positive way. Um, so, so just moving ahead uh, and looking at the psychological aspect. As I said, I, th I believe that this is slightly different to leadership and social. Uh, that, as Jason touched on, one of the things in, that, that we need to uh, bring back in what we do is the passion for the position, uh, the love for the game and the enjoyment. And some of that does come from having the, uh, the games that you have, the competitions that you have in your training. So this is, this is a key element, especially for, for young goalkeepers. Uh, you know, and when coaches do get on goalkeepers for making mistakes, and as I said, a young field player is developing, a young goalkeeper is expected to be technically and tactically sound and not make mistakes, and it's going to be their fault when the ball goes in the back of the net. So it's a very uneven scale for, for goalkeepers and players. But again, giving them permission to fail, if you like, is, is important to also allow them to enjoy what they're doing. Um, so the mistake recognition and management and being able to facilitate that with the goalkeeper is essential. The, the confidence side of things, confidence, you know, and we all um, have different ways of building confidence in our goalkeepers. A lot of goalkeeper coaches believe that uh, a proper repetition will breed confidence in motion, confidence in movements, confidence in being able to make saves. Whatever you do to enhance the goal confidence, whatever you do to have a positive impact on the performance of the goalkeeper, um, that builds their confidence. So obviously that's a massive part of goalkeeping. Um, the readiness and preparedness uh, to be psychologically to, to be good, to, to be able to perform. And that's what goalkeepers are expected to do. We get limited actions in a game. So we're expected to perform in those actions. But do we as coaches give the goalkeepers the correct tools to manage that? Is there someone that can assist them with the management and being prepared to play? Are we enabling that? Are we, are we mindful of the environment? Are the other coaches mindful of the environment? And are they mindful of the environment? Are they, the, are they a younger goalkeeper stepping into an older team? 
Um, are they an older goalkeeper dropping in to play for a younger team? Uh, so, for example, a, a U16 goalkeeper who's moved up to uh, a U17 team? Or is it a, a, a young goalkeeper stepping in? I know we have a lot of university and college coaches on the, on the meeting or in the meeting with us. Uh, is it a, a freshman coming in at 17 and is taking the place of someone who's a little bit older? There, there are things, things that we have to be mindful of and the environment is massive. Do we as coaches give the players the tools to do that? Again, being aware of themselves and aware of others. Uh, I had a very interesting discussion recently uh, with, with a, a very well-known coach and, and I asked him what was the key element, the core element of goalkeeping? Um, and his answer to me was the awareness of themselves and he deals with with elite goalkeepers he said the awareness of themselves um, and I had to stop and think about that because it's different for me it's different for me when I'm looking at younger goalkeepers and developing goalkeepers but he said knowing where they fit in knowing what their skill set is knowing what their parameters and their limits are and you only know that when you've been through seasons upon seasons of playing and you've had experience after experience. So obviously older goalkeepers is, is his forte and that's what he went with. But having awareness of yourself is, is important. Um, the coaching relationship. So the psychological aspects uh, of the goalkeeper coach and the goalkeeper. And we could talk for an hour straight just about that. So, so we're not going to. But uh, obviously, it's a special relationship that, and there's a trust factor that, that has to be built between goalkeepers and goalkeeper coaches. Um, and, and how you do that is by putting money in the bank, by believing in the goalkeeper, by giving him or her the tools to succeed, by telling her or him, the, giving them real feedback, giving them feedback that's going to assist them, not telling them that they're great all the time. Um, Psychologically, the ability to manage emotion uh, is, is a challenging one for all goalkeepers. And, and in the last week or so, uh, just personally, we've, we've had some uh, meetings, some evaluation meetings over Zoom with academy goalkeepers. And the ability to stay even keel when you're receiving information that may be not the most positive information, that's, that's important from a goalkeeper's point of view, but also from a coach's point of view to manage your emotions. This is a word that I didn't really think much about uh, and, until the last two years. And inhibition, um, and, and my translation of this is preventing you from doing what you want to do. So, so for example, uh, taking a second to evaluate deeper the, your, your movement, your tactical decision before you commit to it. The ball is being served, I wanna go for it. And maybe you go too late, too early, uh, but you haven't really assessed it. So, so holding the goalkeepers, making them patient, building patience in a goalkeeper. Um, the ball is slipped through from the halfway line and do I come charging out? Uh, and try and win the ball? Uh, you know, is that within my capabilities to do that? Am I reading the play correctly? Uh, obviously, experience comes into that, but building in patience in our goalkeeper training uh, will, will, and goalkeeper coaching will allow goalkeepers to, again, deal with uh, the ability to make quality decisions. And then information processing. This is, this is a buzzword right now. So cognitive development. Everyone... Uh, who is on the call will talk about cognitive development at some point. Cognitive development, um, it can't be put into one category. We can't say I'm doing cognitive training because much like coaching and designing a session, you have to know which element of the cognitive training you're working on. Are you working on perception? Are you working on depth perception? Are you working on reaction speed? What elements of the cognitive development are you working on? And that, that, that's imperative, again, as we do sessions, that we know what we're trying to do when, we, when we're working on the cognitive side of things. And then finally, as, as Jason alluded to, this on the psychological side of things, it's always changing, always changing. Um, from age to age, from position to position. And what I mean by that is psychology changes 
if you start three games in a row. Psychology changes if sometimes if you let if you have a bad mistake and your team loses one nil, what happens in the next uh, in the next week of training or the next game? What does the manager do? What does the coach do? What is the impact on you as the goalkeeper coach? So this changes by circumstances, and it certainly changes age to age. And we all know uh, young goalkeepers that go through different stages. And we know, we know what can happen to them as they hit certain stages. So it's constantly changing. And as a coach, we have to stay up to date with where they are in their development, where they are psychologically from game to game. If you're managing a team of some kind or, or you've got two or three goalkeepers that you need to work with and manage on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we need to be, make sure that we are up to date on all different aspects of the psychological piece so we can understand the changes that are taking place. So as we move ahead here, just to look at a, a, an interesting video and Jason, I'll let you talk through it. Yeah, the, the fun part of this conversation, Phil, is just as you're going through that, it get, it's got me thinking, I've, I've wrote down a couple of things here, sort of the blanket, what you're talking about there is creating a safe environment for goalkeepers to come into. And when you talk about safe environment, for them to express their thoughts, their feelings, uh, their interpretation, understanding of the game, to try different techniques, different starting positions within the run of, run of the game. So by uh, psychologically creating this safe environment for goalkeepers, we then, we're then creating an environment where they can flourish and, and almost take ownership. And that's sort of where this, this video sort of segues into. Everyone here is in the same boat and, and has had probably limited uh, competitive games uh, throughout the last probably 16 to 18 weeks. Uh, one thing we've done is we've used this time to actually um, provide opportunities for our goalkeepers to actually take parts of the session. And this is not an idea that I've come up with. This is actually something that I've taken from uh, a very well-known coach back in England. Um, who's doing a lot of really good work at the, at the Premier League and stroke um, international level. So basically, the video you're going to see here is one of our under-19s goalkeepers actually leading a technical part of, of the session. It's got no uh, volume, but you'll see how they're interacting. And then to give you a bit of an idea, I'm then sort of leading him um, with, with sort of trigger words and interpretations to see where his thoughts are at where his different types of interpretation is of, of what they're doing. So very simple movement, handling, uh, activation, but you'll see um, how he's communicating with the player or the players. The one thing I'll say off the back of this is going into a conversation with the lad after, he's expressed to me, he has a, automatically a different understanding for what's being asked of him in different situations because he's thinking about the game differently. Um, and also the, the self-confidence and belief that come from him just leading this part of the session was massive. Had a major knock-on effect onto the younger goalkeepers because now they're asking to do the same. So it's actually created a really unique and cool culture. So as you see, he's, he's obviously just addressing the group here. And this is something we've started to bring in more and more, certainly throughout this period. And this is something that we can, we can use certainly now where there isn't a ton of competitive games. It's almost the perfect opportunity to provide education just in a different way. So, so moving on, tactical decision-making. Again, we talk about coupling these things together. So tactical decision-making with physical actions, with technical execution. Um, these things are, are coupled together. Um, do, do we help the goalkeepers with their role clarity? So again, are we putting goalkeepers into a tactical situation where they uh, have certain outcomes? Are, we, are the goalkeepers aware of their role within the team, within the system of play? What's expected of them from the, when they go from a small 18, well, it's not an 18-yard box, a 12-yard box to an 18-yard box? And how does that impact them tactically and their positioning? Um, this, this is a big one. Game management in possession and out of possession. Um, so, so you go back to some of the games that you watch on a daily basis. And luckily for us, um, as, as many television outlets in America right now are saying, there are 40 games in 19 days or something like that. So we're all going to be glued watching 
uh, Premier League for a little bit. Um, but game management. At the end of the game, what are we doing? In the middle of the game, what are we doing? Are, are our goalkeepers actually aware of this? And do we give them that information? Even at young ages, and when I say young ages, I'm talking 12, 13, and so on. Are those things that we can sort of start to lay into the goalkeeper's uh, development? At the end of the game, if we're winning, take some more time, or what, you know, whatever it may be. Try not to do this, that. Can we give them little nuggets that they can take away and build on as they improve tactically? So this is an interesting stat. Uh, and this was something that uh, J Jason actually, Jason and I were in, in Germany a couple of years ago uh, and a, a program run by the DFB. And they did a study of goals conceded and how goals are conceded. Um, and the mistakes that they, they deemed, they deemed were goalkeeper mistakes. What percentage were technical? What percentage were tactical? So 87% of mistakes were room, what they called room defense. So that was the space between the back line and the goalkeeper. 87% of mistakes were space or tactical decisions, defending the space behind the goal, behind the back four or back three, whatever the, the uh, system was. So that means that if we can improve the, obviously if we can improve tactical decision making, perhaps goals go down, which is a no brainer. That's, that, that's not rocket science. But it was interesting to see that 87% of goals that were conceded were not technical mistakes at the highest level. Uh, so what are the expectations? We touched on this, 9v9 to 11v11, 11v11 uh, at U12 or U13, 11v11 at U18, 11v11 at a professional level. What are the expectations in the game model? What are the expectations systemically and tactically as deemed from manager to manager and coach to coach? Are the goalkeepers aware of this? And how do we as goalkeeper coaches relay that information to impact in a positive way the tactical decision making of our goalkeepers? Angle play and positioning, obviously that varies. Um, from, as I said, from a small sided environment to a larger sided environment. And even in a training day, are we preparing the goalkeepers to handle this and make tactical decisions based upon the situation that they're in? So positioning and angle play should be something that we are constantly talking about. And yet, um, as goalkeeper coaches, and, and you look at, I would say, 80% of the information that you see online right now, um, and, and I understand that that is the major way of uh, disseminating information, but I'd say 70 to 80 percent of what we see is from straight on. Goalkeeper training, training straight on, right down the middle. And yet so much of the play, so many of the goals come from angles and can we train, can we reposition things to train at angles and give goalkeepers a realistic training environment. Obviously, this is an absolutely massive one. Um, and I did have someone reach out to me after the last call and, and ask me to talk about set pieces. Uh, the problem with talking about set pieces is that is a week long conversation at least, and we can't do it justice in this session tonight. Uh, with over 33% of goals coming from set pieces. Um, and I did touch on this in, in a previous presentation. Uh, where, where I felt I made a mistake as a coach um, with our goalkeeper. We played uh, LAFC um, in Los Angeles. Uh, the goalkeeper saw 10 corner kicks, saw 10 corners uh, against us. Uh, obviously, that tells you that they were absolutely pounding us. Um, saw 10 corners. He hadn't seen a live corner since the game before. So that impacted the way that I approached training. Um, so set pieces, can you, can you give goalkeepers information on set pieces and train set pieces in a way in, within your training throughout the course of the week? That might be how a situation starts. It may be uh, the end action of a situation. So uh, just something to think about. And I apologize to the coach. We, we, you know, set pieces are such a massive element. We will be touching on that at a future time. Tactical uh, execution. 
Um, and this is obviously we make we make a choice. Uh, the goalkeeper, uh, based on the principles uh, and elements that, that he or she has decided, um, ha has come out, and we give them uh, we give them options to make a, a tactical decision. Um, but do we give them an escape valve? Oftentimes, we try and ask the goalkeeper to play the correct ball, and he or she tries to play the correct ball or tries to come for the ball in the way that we've asked them to make the save, and it's not effective for them, and therefore they make a mistake. So are we giving them an escape valve? Are we giving them a way to manage a situation until such time as they can find the appropriate uh, solution? And then the, the evaluation and feedback. Are we giving real feedback? Are we giving correct evaluation? Do we look back at the video? Do we recreate the scenario? Are we giving them the proper feedback so that they do improve and get better? Um, just, just one quick example of, of the, the tactical escape valve. I've been working with a, a number of young goalkeepers who can't who can't deal with the ball going back over their head. And it's a common problem in young goalkeepers. Um, and every goalkeeper coach that they've had has said, yeah, well, when the ball goes over your head, uh, you drop step, you cross over, you go up with the hand nearest the ball, and you push it over the bar. They cannot physically do that because when they do that, uh, they don't get, they're not old enough to get the elevation off the ground. They're not uh, proficient enough to drive straight up. Um, so my fix, my escape valve was when you see the ball being hit, can you backpedal quickly so you're now on two feet, not one, push straight up and go with two hands and create a larger surface area behind the ball. Um, one of the most powerful positions in sports is the squat. So... That was my, and again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, that was my escape valve for the goalkeepers until they're physically capable of going off of one foot. Can we find a way for them to manage going off of two? So again, that's just a little, little thing that I've tried. So this is, Jason, I'll just turn this one over to you. Yeah, when we're talking about evaluating the game, obviously there's a number of ways that we can, we can do this as coaches. I feel you alluded to obviously watching the video. Um, one, one other thing is where we can actually start to look at what are the key actions required from the goalkeeper throughout different types of games. So, for example, this is the, the information you're going to see here is taken from the under-12 level uh, that play nine versus nine, and this is taken over five games. This information then provides me the opportunity to then analyze how is our game model? How does it look? Are the goalkeepers obviously being effective, but then are they getting the necessary repetitions in training? So training and the games are starting to match up. Um, so the first one here, as you look up, we'll start from the bottom and work up. One of the terminology we use, we talk about playing around. We could talk, this could also be called rotating the ball, switching the play. Uh, 130 different actions over five games. This is, to give you an idea, 80% of those were from the feet and then the additional 20 were from the hands. So we talk about hand distribution. Are the goalkeepers getting enough technical repetitions with different types of bowling and throwing that's required in training so they can be successful in games? As you work up the field, we have the playing through. Are goalkeepers looking to find an, maybe an interior player who's on the half turn facing forward are they looking to find that? 27 actions. Again, I'd say 80% of those have come from the feet and we've got 20% uh, of them coming from the hands. So again, are we creating different environments, different games? And I'll show you some videos and examples uh, of, of what we've done to, to give you a bit of an idea. And then we talk about playing higher up the field, playing into and playing beyond. Um, you'll notice that we haven't included playing onto. Um, it's not a big element of of youth or small-sided soccer, if you like. Very rarely are we asking or even allowed uh, for players at this age to be heading the ball. And that varies from state to state and league to league. We've just left it off altogether. So we've, we've talked about playing into it and playing beyond. And then obviously it gives you a, a whole range of different techniques that you can use within that. Obviously, as you see, as you go higher up the field there, the less and less actions. One, it's because physically they're not able to do so. But two, it's also because 
there's a there's a there can be a mismatch and sometimes it's not being provided as an option or as Phil as you alluded to that escape bow. So they're not really given the chance to be able to look for it because of what the game model or what our game models what is being asked. So we have to make some uh, some adjustments as well to make sure that they are developing not only the the vision to look for those passes, but obviously then the technical um, executions to be able to do so. So we have to allow for that as well. And then as we go into outer possession, and again, same under 12, over five games, nine versus nine, I'll start with the shot stopping actions from outside the box. And, and this is where this stat is probably higher at the small sided game than it is the, the full sided game. And again, you, it comes down to field dimensions, et cetera. Phil, you alluded to the, eight, uh, the, the quote unquote 18 yard box. Obviously, it's going to vary from field to field. It's anywhere from 12 to 14 yards um, in that depth. So they're going to see shot stopping from a, from a certain distance, and it's also going to come through traffic. Um, so are we creating that situation over and over again in training? Because, again, that's what the game's requiring. And then shot stopping actions inside the box. These are then a mixture of one versus one, shot stopping central, shot stopping angles. We have to then be creating, recreating these in training. And we, again, we have, to, we have to have some sort of understanding of not only where the, uh, where the shot's coming from, but obviously then the type of shot. Is it a one versus one? Is it a one-touch finish? So you could take something like this and break it in even more uh, detail and go even more in depth in your own environments. The crosses in the run of play were actually very limited. As you see, only three actions over the five games. So for me, when I was looking at this, it was not something that we have to throw in in regards to being in the run of play. But one of the actions that were extremely high was saying that you've just touched upon there, Phil, in it, when you're talking about the LAFC game, we're actually seeing at the small side level, we're seeing a lot of direct play from set pieces. So again, it got me thinking in we have to make sure that the, the goalkeepers are at least competent and comfortable with dealing with some sort of direct play from wide areas. So then it goes into then looking at how we're designing the session. So this is then small-sided goalkeepers. These goalkeepers are here at 10, 11, and 12. The ball's starting where they're starting in possession. So the ball's rotated through the goalkeeper from the four into the five. Once it goes into that five, the game's live. They can go to either goal. If the goalkeeper gains possession and wins possession, they can attack the opposite goal with a, with a strike. So then this is, was my way of, of getting the goalkeeper to look more into the deck through and then uh, in two, based on obviously some of the stats that you've just seen. Then there a little progression here. As the ball's played, then they're under pressure from a quote-unquote from a nine. Same rules apply. Um, once it goes in, it can go live, go to any goal. But what it does, does throw up is it throws up a lot of situations where the goalkeepers have to make decisions on whether they've got to defend the room or they've got to defend the goal. Then obviously then we allow for then the technical development to happen with inside these tactical games. And you'll notice the goalkeepers are constantly flipping between being in possession and being out of possession. This is now a view of, of our pre-professional goalkeepers. Again, working in possession, balls rotated. And then from there, um, two attackers are attacking one way, two attackers attacking the other. And it's creating lots of two versus one situations. And then the last one here is just a game. You'll see the goals are offset on the diagonal. The rules are very simple. Three passes anywhere, and then the game's live. Once the game's live, again, you'll create shot stopping central, shot stopping angled. You'll create one versus ones. You'll cut, create cutbacks. And again, the goalkeepers are going from in possession and out possession. So not only is there a technical focus here, but the, ele the element of tactical decision-making is, is paramount. And then the very last piece is then the goalkeeper being integrated in with the team. Um, again, you'll notice I've started the session with the goalkeeper being in possession and then it's acting like there's a transitional moment into the seven and then, it, then it's the goalkeepers working on the relationship with then defending the area. So again, all these things become critical as we move through yeah, and, you, and you see a really uh, thorough progression there uh, through the age groups. Again, can we, with, with our session planning, can we ask the goalkeepers to build, build in 
technique while making simple tactical adjustments, simple tactical decisions. Um, so the last last two pieces here. So the the, the leadership and social um, effective communication. Uh, a, a lot of goalkeepers often say, "Well, I don't know what to say." Um, so we we have to give our goalkeepers the very very basics. Um, and for me, any ball that comes inside the area, uh, a young age is either keepers or away, and that's the simplest simplest most direct thing that we can we can ask our goalkeepers to do. Um, but as we progress, obviously, the information, uh, we need to create students of the game so that they understand what the implications of the information they give are. So, again, as a, as a goalkeeper coach, making sure that we're using it in training. Uh, one of the things that I, I see a lot of is I see um, a lot of goalkeeper coaches asking a goalkeeper to call for the ball and call for the ball repeatedly, saying, ball here, ball here, ball, and just repeating things over and over. Uh, and again, if, if we as, as, a, as a goalkeeping community can have short, sharp, concise directions that are effective, that is much better than mumbling things over and over again. Um, the organization, so understanding the rules, the, the, the roles um, within the team, within the goalkeeping group, Within, within the club, those things become really, really important. So the, your overall organization. Um, then we can flip that into the organization within the team. Uh, understanding the roles of the players, understanding the game and how it's supposed to be played. Managing the expectations of the players, um, understanding what the players' strengths and weaknesses are and understanding the situation within the game. Yeah, and that may be goal up, goal down, and so on. Um, as you get older, and I know we have a lot of uh, people on the call that are coaching at a very, very high level. Obviously, you know that if the if if your number two, the right back, is is not great at attacking out of the back, and their first touch is often leading to a tackle, um, you're probably as a goal as a goalkeeper coach. You're probably asking your goalkeeper, "Hey, look, look to play out on the left side instead of the right." You know, so knowing the players, knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are, is critical as you move forward in the ages. Um, again, we talked about this. The, the social side is a constant challenge, and it's a constant change um, based on age, based on role within the team, ba based on results. So those things are, are, are very, very difficult to manage. But we as goalkeeper coaches need to be able to give information along those lines. But we also need to understand what the goalkeepers are going through at any, any, any single time. Um, the team dynamics and locker room management. Um, how does the goalkeeper conduct him or herself in the locker room? What are the dynamics that have been allowed? Um, what is the leadership on the team like? And how do we integrate the goalkeeper into the team dynamics? Does she or, or he want to be involved in those dynamics or do they want to take more of a backseat and, and wait for their performance? So again, managing the locker room um, and what happens in the locker room, especially at young ages, can be really, really important. Because as you know, uh, young players, both on the men's side and the women's side, can, can be brutal, especially when it's wins or losses, and the goalkeeper may or may not have made a mistake. Um, the role within the team, Jason touched on it. You're number one, number two, and number three. How do you manage them? How do you, how do you excite them? How do you get them to feel like they're part of things? How do you keep them ready? Uh, and again, for those people that uh, are, are, in the, are in the US, um, I coached at the Philadelphia Union. We used all three of our goalkeepers this year at different times for different reasons. So um, knowing the role within the team, but as a goalkeeper coach, preparing every one of them for success, preparing every one of them to be ready at any given time. And then presence, uh, and, and really for, for you as a goalkeeper coach, uh, you're gonna decide what you think presence is. For me, presence is an aura, it's a demeanor, it's how you conduct yourself, it's a professional appearance on and off the pitch. It's conducting yourself in a manner that is respectable and respected. Uh, you may have your own vision of what presence is. I, I hope you do. I hope that there's something that you can take and maybe even add to that. 
and try and cultivate that with the young goalkeepers that you have. Um, often presence can be affected um, by mistakes. So or, uh, we talked about mistake management with the psychological aspect of things, how you manage. Do they turn around, punch the floor, walk off the pitch, throw their gloves, whatever. So how, how can we help manipulate that to build presence in the young boys and girls that we train to be goalkeepers at the highest levels? And then from, from the leadership and social side, the coach's input. Do we as coaches, uh, uh, and this is a hypothetical question, do we arm the athletes with the tools that they need to be successful? We often spend so much time working on mastering the ball and working on catching and, and whatever the action may be. Are we providing them assistance and growth in leadership and the social environment? And that, that obviously is something, it's not my area of expertise. I don't claim to be an expert in that. I don't, be a, I don't claim to be an expert in the, in the physical piece or the psychological piece, but I'm constantly trying to get better, constantly trying to improve um, and be open and honest with the goalkeepers that I work with so that I can help them in a better way. And then finally, the foundation, the foundation for me, the, uh, the, the big part, the, the key element is the technical piece. Are we creating goalkeepers that are foundationally strong? Um, one of the things that, that we want to do is we want to equip the goalkeeper in possession and out of possession to be successful in their environment. And that means, are we giving them the correct footwork? Are we working at the correct angles? Are we giving them the correct actions? And are we providing them with tools for ball mastery? And that might be with the feet, it might be with the hands, it might be with the body. Are we providing them with all the tools they need in, in a logical progression through the age groups to be foundationally strong? Um, are we studying the game and the game demands? So as coaches, are we doing our piece to look at how and why things are occurring in the game? And then are we asking the goalkeepers to do the same thing? Are we providing the goalkeepers with realistic environments and we've talked about this and maybe I'm, I'm beating the drum again here but are they performing realistic actions in a realistic area of the pitch with realistic service and again sometimes your why why you do something that is not one of those three things why you do it might be uh, it's a fun warm-up it's uh, you know the, uh, an activation piece you might have a different reason why but the majority of times are we doing these things in a realistic setting so that when it's game time whether it's a young goalkeeper or, or an older goalkeeper they've seen this action as a coach um, do you have a precise methodology and a philosophy are you are you aware of how you want your end product to look like so if you had a, a, a mold of a goalkeeper and you added to it and you built it and you built it and you built it kind of like a jigsaw puzzle at the end of that jigsaw puzzle what would your goalkeeper look like what would be the layers that you add what would be the pieces that you put in place piece by piece to build your goalkeeper to make he or she the best that they could be regardless of their whether they're going to be professional we're not talking about being professional we're talking about reaching the highest level they can possibly reach and for some, that is just enjoying playing the game. And that is 100% fine. But are we giving them the tools to do that? Um, technical, technical, for me, technical proficiency allows for the unorthodox. And what I mean by that is you look at, um, you look at and, and I apologize to go to this because it, it's prevalent right now, but you, you look at the goalkeepers in the Premier League, okay? And you look at the goalkeepers in the Champions League. And I would personally, I would say that maybe, maybe goalkeepers like Loris, Jan Sommer, um, let's just use those two for now, would be technically, technically good goalkeepers. Um, but then you, then you look at what happened today. So, uh, and if, if anyone saw the Manchester City game today, there's a great example there, Sam Johnson, the West Brom goalkeeper, 
makes two saves in the last five minutes with his feet. But his movement to get into the position, his body shape when he gets into position, so the technical pieces allow him to make this unorthodox save, or two unorthodox saves, and they come away with the result. Okay, so for me, again, a technical base being foundationally strong leads to other methods. But we have, you know, we, we've got nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds performing blocking shapes. And as, as, it, as just creating a, if, if it's just to create a barrier to stop the ball from going in the goal, I can understand that because we're saying to them, just make yourself as big as possible. I understand that. But if we're actually teaching that instead of try and get your hands to the ball, I think we're doing a disservice to the young goalkeepers. And then fundamentally, technique is the core of what we do. Technique is, uh, as Jason said, at the young ages, technique is a primary focus. Amongst all other things, technique becomes that primary focus. And again, there are different techniques and we will all teach them differently, but that becomes a primary focus. So as we look, this is, this is another one. Jason, I'll turn it over to you for this. Yeah, and it's often talked about, we, we, we want to create technically efficient goalkeepers to be tactically effective. So the, the more technical efficient we can, then tactically we're going to be able to affect the game in a, in a really positive way. So again, as we played a video here, so if you want to hit play feel, we're just talking about different types of movements and everything's geared really around one versus one situations here. So it's just a basic situation where we're looking at different shapes. Um, short block, we'll refer to this too. And then obviously winning of the loose ball. So then again, as, as Phil talked about, the importance of getting the hands to the ball is absolutely huge. But we'll look at a little bit of the shape as well. So we've done it here initially in a very, very controlled manner. However, we progressed it pretty quickly um, into now a situation where we'll call more skill development because there's more, vi there's more visual cues to work off of here. So simple, three versus zero rondo, playing one touch. The moment um, I put the foot on the ball, goalkeepers have to move to touch the mannequin. So they're moving out of the line of the ball, moving back into the line of the ball, and they have to defend their goal. Obviously, anything can happen here. There can be a first phase, there can be a second phase. If there is a second phase, goalkeepers have to be alert and alive to any type of second phase. If it does come off of them, obviously then we have to recover and, and look for that next ball. Then it would progress into then a similar situation, but with the older goalkeepers. You'll notice this is still technical work, but it's done within the, the goal and it's done within the area of the field that they're going to actually look at some of these actions. So you start with, we're in possession, and as if we've just turned possession over. I've got two options. I can either take the shot from distance, as you see there, or I can try and play between the gap between the white and the orange mannequin. If I do so, the goalkeeper's aiming to win the ball outright on my side of the mannequins. He's not allowing the ball to break that line. So we're looking at the goalkeeper technically coming to win the loose ball. So all I'm doing is creating lots and lots of repetition. And then the second part being, once they've won the ball, then we're looking at some sort of technical block. Is it realistic to the game? Not necessarily, because they often you wouldn't go from winning the loose ball to, the, to then obviously blocking. However, for me, um, and my reasons for the, for the day were just to get lots of different repetition in, in the parts of the goal and the parts of the area that they're, they're going to see these scenarios. But you'll notice from the, from the first group all the way through, yeah, there's a technical focus, but it's, it gets a little bit more complex as we've gone through. So there's some, there's some small, subtle decision-making that the goalkeepers have to go through. So, so some of the other factors, uh, and as we're bringing this to a close, and I appreciate your attention. Again, there's, there's people from all over the world, so I, I understand we've, we've gone for over an hour. Um, the, the other factors that may come in. Okay, so Jason, I'll let you talk about this one. Yeah. The, the, the power of conversation is incredible. This has come from a, a conversation I had with one of our goalkeepers recently, and we were, we were discussing um, different things away from the field, and we both referred to it as, as invisible training. Without reinventing the wheel, um, we've got our five pillars of the game, 
this almost becomes that sixth pillar of the game without reinventing the wheel. It's all about what the goalkeepers are doing when nobody else is watching. And this will give players the extra 5 or 10% within their performance, within their development. So what are they doing away from the field? Are they willing to, to study video, not only on the, of themselves, but maybe role models or idols they have within the game? How then, and we've touched upon it tonight, how's their hydration? How's their nutrition? Rest, recovery? How's their preparation for the game? All these things allude to the, the things that we don't necessarily see on the field. And that's why we sort of come up with this, this term without reinventing the wheel, almost invisible training. Uh, and, it, and it adds, it gives everyone that different edge, that 5 or 10%, that might be the difference um, within progressing. So one of the things that, uh, in, in putting this together, Jason and I also talked about back in the day, and I, I'm not sure that this happens quite as much uh, as, as it used to, but, you know, I, I can remember, but, um, be, well, it's a long, long, long time ago, but I can remember being a kid and, and trying to make saves like, uh, like one of the goalkeepers. I'm not going to say a goalkeeper's name because then I'll really age myself, but, but are, are, are kids making saves like, like De Gea? Are they making saves like Ashlyn Harris? Are they, you know, are they, are they making saves uh, and emulating their idols? Are, are they doing things... Um, are they watching and, and learning from the people that they, they, they aspire to be, if you like? Uh, and, and are they asking the question, why? Um, so this happened. Why, why did it happen? Um, he or she did this or said that, and this was the result. This is what I saw. What do you think? Having those discussions now with so much access, uh, with messaging and with, with uh, the availability of video, uh, of goalkeepers of all levels, asking the question why and really developing their, their, their love for the game and passion for the game. Um, the other side of this is what do, what do we need? So as we, again, as we bring this to a close, we need, and I'm, I'm talking globally and I'm talking individually. So I, I live in America. There is no direction whatsoever, no structure and no network in America to develop goalkeeper coaches and therefore develop goalkeepers. Um, in other parts of the world, there is a clear structure, there's a clear direction. And I think those, those countries are seeing an evolution in their goalkeeping, especially at the young ages. As a coach, as a coach, as a member of staff of a, of a unit, a family, a team, do you have a direction? Do you have a structure? And do you have a network that you use? Do you have a network of people that help you, that help supply you, that help challenge you? So we need this. We need this globally in our environments and we need this professionally and individually. Um, again, globally, so collectively and individually. Do you have a profile? Is there a profile? Is there a plan? Is there a method? Is there, is there a, something to aim towards? Um, some of us have it. Uh, I know, for example, it was one of the first things that w when I took my current position, that was one of the first things that I did uh, was to try and create a profile and a plan of how to get there from, from the academy all the way up to the first team. But do we have that as a country? Do you have that as a country in a country that you live? Um, is, is there a way to create that for yourself? It takes some time, it takes some studying, it takes some time, but it also comes down to your own individual methodology and philosophy. And that. And now, now, as we talk about that jigsaw puzzle, your plan and your profile, now you can start to build that jigsaw puzzle. Knowing the why, and, and, and I've said this time and time again, knowing why we do what we do, knowing why people uh, are doing different exercises and so on. Know the reason why, because w without judging. Do you know your why? Is there a specific reason you're doing a, a, a certain activity? Or is it just a, a cookie cutter approach of, I saw Jason's video, therefore I'm going to do that without really knowing the implications of what they were doing. Again, developing realistic training environments. Um, and or I should have added in there a training culture as well. So developing human beings. Um, our, our environments that we create, 
Jason used the word a safe environment. We're also in the a, in a business of developing human beings, developing people to be good people. So within our, within our environment and our coach to player relationships, can we develop good people in good realistic training environments? And then the fundamentals. We need fundamentals back in the game. I know that, and, and I'm guilty of it as well. There, there are times that we do a lot of actions that are more dynamic in nature that wouldn't necessarily be fundamental to the game. We often overlook the fundamentals um, because we think that we need to work on something that, that we have seen. So we think we need to work on extended diving uh, and some people call it power diving and you see it all over the internet, these flashy saves, when really that is maybe 1% of of the actions that the goalkeeper does over the course of a year um, so can we adapt the basics to to the to your level and environment can we build this can we get a direction individually can we build a profile can we put them in the environments that we create them we develop them holistically um, within a, a fundamental building block so when we go back to the, the goalkeeping for, for all levels. We've touched on a number of different things that have talked about the different pillars of the game um, and components of the game, elements of the game. And we've dissected that to try and say, these are core elements for goalkeepers in these different realms. Again, for me, the number one thing that we should be getting back to is building the technical foundation of our young goalkeepers. That will help them develop tools much like, uh, much like uh, a golf bag, you select a different golf club for different distances, you select a different tool for different aspects of the game. So we've got to give our goalkeepers all of those tools, maybe even including the, the little thing that picks out the mud from your shoes. We've got to include that as well. All the little details add up over time. So given our goalkeepers the opportunity to succeed. So, uh, before we get into the, the, the questions, uh, I just want to say to all of you that have come on and to everyone that watches, th thank you for tuning in. Happy holidays to all of you around the world. Please stay safe and well. Uh, and let's hope that uh, 2021 is a, is a happy and a healthy one. Jason, before we go into uh, the questions from the chat room, this is Jason's contact information. Uh, Jason, again, Thank you so much for your time. I know you scrambled off the field to join us and, and you put in a tremendous amount of work. So I want to thank you. And I know that in a second, you're going to be put on the spot with questions. Okay, so I just want to publicly thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Phil, for having me this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. And then, uh, so in, in our chat room here, in our chat box, again, we will, uh, I've been asked if we will have more of these um, the goal is to have some more and we will um, address goal specific, specific actions in goalkeeping. So uh, less of a global approach and more of a, um, more of a holistic look at, uh, say, 1v1s, crosses, things like that. Um, just, look at, just looking through here. How do we keep our goalkeepers engaged and staying positive when they're training for nothing? Essentially, as we've had this fall. That's, uh, I mean, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I think that this has been the most challenging era for, if, if we could call it an era, for, for all coaches and all professions. How to stay engaged when there's no end goal there's nothing in sight we're, and we're, we're constantly in limbo um, one of the things that i found is that keeping it fresh trying new things um, again having fun warm-ups engaging them in different ways giving them projects away from the field to complete to keep their minds engaged those are just some of the things that i've tried over the course of this year with myself and and and, and the goalkeeping staff at the Philadelphia Union, we've tried to do that just because 
kids are in and out of school. Yes, they're going in for two days, now, now they're not in, and, and so on. It's a real challenge for, for everyone involved. And I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer. Jason, how do you feel? Yeah, uh, just, to, just to echo some of the things that you've touched upon there, creating fun and engaging warm-ups is absolutely massive to kickstart the session. Uh, but then also making sure within your sessions, there's a, there's a ton of competition, not only within the, the goalkeeping uh, core and, and department, if you like, but also having a lot of uh, competition when the, uh, the teams are together. Uh, one of the things we've done here is created a lot of like um, in-house World Cup style events, if you like, where there's lots and lots of competition. Even if we don't have a meaningful game at the end of the week, we have some type of competition. And in fairness, our head coach have done a wonderful job. They've created competitions from 6v6 to 9v9 to 11 versus 11, always creating different looks and different outcomes, not only for the players, but for the goalkeepers. And they've kept a running tally throughout, and it's been excellent. And the players have been fantastic with it. Awesome. Uh, just a couple of other questions. Uh, the, the stat that I said about the 87%, that was actually from the World Cup. So it wasn't from... It was from the Men's World Cup. It was not from uh, from the Bundesliga. It was from the DFB. Um, there's uh, what what if what if you don't have a number one and you have two, you really have two people that can play. Um, again, I, I think that comes down to. Uh, I mean, that, that's that's a luxury. That's great, um, but it comes down to then um, managing game expectations. I think that if if you have two that can play, ultimately becomes the manager's decision. I think it's something that you have to discuss with with the person who is the head coach. If you are the head coach, one of the things that I've seen is I've seen uh, goalkeepers battle it out throughout the course of the year. Uh, if you're not if you're not at the professional level. Um, uh, and you have games, one goalkeeper plays one game, one goalkeeper plays the next. And then over the course of time, they have a body of work and you would decide who would be best suited if there comes into a cup final or something like that. That's something that I've seen a lot of coaches do. Um, you have to have buy-in from everyone involved because that's very, very tricky to manage. Um, other than that, I think um, if, if you're at a professional level or a high level where there are different games that can be played, one plays the cup games, one plays the league games. Um, that's, that's something that a lot of goalkeeper coaches do, a lot of managers do. Um, head coaches and managers get the big money for, for, them, for that reason. They make those decisions. Uh, do, you, do you have anything different, Jason? No, I feel you're absolutely spot on there. And I think the... the the biggest learning curve for me throughout maybe having two goalkeepers in, in, in that situation is to always be honest and open and not allow for any last minute surprises, whether it be the team sheet, etc. Goalkeepers always, always respect it when you're, and players respect it when you're very open and honest and, and pretty early in those conversations. So they know, they know what's coming. I think when, it, when you leave it to the last minute and they, they may be blindsided, that's when the, the issues can, can, uh, can maybe crop up at times. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, if it, our job is to prepare all the goalkeepers. Our job is to make sure that everyone is able to play and willing, and they, you know, we've given them the tools to be successful. Um, you want your number two to push your number one. Um, so if there is a dip in form, for example, he or she can step in. Um, and then even the number three needs to know that he or she has a chance. Um, so, so that comes down to your management of them, your time invested in them. Um, are you working on a, on a game day where there's only a one and two involved? Are you working with the number three at all? Is the number three involved in the, in, in the pre-game training? You know, and we've talked about that before. Um, is play, so this, this is a very interesting question. Is, is play development such... Is play development such as goalkeeping better with the team approach or regional approach? So I'm guessing that means um, within a, a certain group or within your goalkeeper group. I think uh, the goalkeeper develops. You, there's definitely a need for isolation training, training in isolation with your goalkeeper coach and goalkeeper unit. 
Um, but there is also a massive, massive learning piece that occurs with, uh, with the team. Typically, if you wanted to break a team session down, uh, what's most appropriate in, in a lot of different cases is a third of the time the goalkeeper is with the team. Uh, sorry, a third of the time the goalkeeper is with the goalkeeper coach. Two thirds of the time he or she is with the team. That way, you're spending twice the amount of time with the team than you are with the goalkeeper coach. And that is a very, very simple way of, of managing the environment. It's something that uh, the, we've tried to implement where we are. Uh, and I feel like we have enough time. But again, you have to be organized and planned and prepared for any eventuality within that session. So, um, Jason, we'll stop there. We've, we've been, on, been on an awful long time. Uh, coaches, if again, if there are questions that weren't answered or other questions that you may have, my email is there, Jason's email is there. Uh, I want to thank you um, for being with us. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm going to stop the share now. Um, I really, really appreciate all your time and energy and the commitment that you all have to goalkeeping and developing young goalkeepers, both male and female, around the world. Um, again, we will, uh, we've been asked if we will have other topics, other discussions. There will be a, another series of three that will uh, address uh, certain aspects of goalkeeping. So a less global approach and a more uh, maybe 1v1s, crosses, set pieces type approach. Um, but again, coaches, thank you so much. Happy holidays to everyone. Please stay safe, uh, enjoy your family and friends. If myself or Jason can be of any help to you whatsoever, please don't hesitate to reach out, uh, whether it's on social media or on email. Uh, we'd be happy to, to talk with any of you. So again, thank you very much. Please stay safe. Jason, thank you as always. Um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Phil. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Good night, coaches. Thank you. Bad hand. <laughs>